Hey, everybody. Welcome to another episode of Voices of Recovery. I'm your host, Michelle Ike, and this is my book, How to Kill an Addiction, Recovery with God. In this book, I talk about how to walk out of any life controlling issue, and we pretty much all have them, with a relationship with God. And I have 20 powerful testimonies of real people who have done just that with God's help. So I'd love for you to check it out. But every week I do interview somebody who has overcome a life controlling issue. And this week, my guest is Travis. Travis, welcome to Voices of Recovery. Thanks for having me. I'm excited. I am excited too. And if you could just take a moment to introduce yourself to our audience, please. Okay. I'm Travis White. I'm a life coach, integrator, author, and speaker. I live in East Texas with my beautiful wife and uh, our adult daughter lives next door to us. Our son is a teacher a couple of hours away and um, we enjoy helping people. Three years ago, my wife got certified and trained and she coaches with me when she's not doing her day job working with international students. And uh, other than that, we love to travel. We love to make people smile. We love animals and we love the outdoors. Uh, that's wonderful. Okay. Well, thank you so much. And it's great to have you. So you are really an answer to prayer, Travis, because I have interviewed many women who have overcome childhood sexual abuse, but not a man. And I've really been praying about that because I think that telling a man's story is going to help men and women, right? But primarily men, because let's face it, sometimes men are more reluctant to talk about their feelings, share things, share personal things and go there, so to speak. So I'm just, I'm so happy for your courage. I appreciate it. And you are the author of the book, We Are All Fireflies, Finding Your Light in the Darkness. Yep. So talk a little bit about that and what the firefly represents. Well, it's, it's a story a long time coming and you're right. We don't talk about it. Men and women, a lot of men and women trauma, whether it's sexual abuse or not, but us men have a special penchant for avoiding <laughs> issues like that. Um, you know, culture and masculinity, and we're taught that it's a weakness to be vulnerable and, and, um, it, it took me 40 years to get brave enough to share my story. Uh, my wife and I are fixing to celebrate our 34th wedding anniversary, and she's only known for 13 years. So it's just something we hold in. Uh, the Firefly thing, um, like anybody in their 40s or older, when we were younger, there was a lot more fireflies around, and yep. we caught them in the jar, and I used to put them in the window. Mm -hmm. uh, I loved them like every kid, but I would catch them and put them in a window at night, and it was during one of the first, one of the two times I was being sexually abused. Wow. And I had this idea in my head as a little six-year-old kid that the light would protect me from the darkness. Mm -hmm. And the name stuck not only for that, but when I was going through my darkest times, right before my transition into my own healing, which became the book, mm -hmm. I'm sitting in a coffee shop with a friend and I'm telling him that story and I'm telling him I need help. And that was the first time I'd uttered that word for me, mm -hmm. even though I'd helped a lot of other people over the years. Um, and when I told him the story about fireflies, he looked at me and he said, well, that light never was yours. That was theirs. And he said, how do you know that you're not the firefly and you just lost connection to your light? And wow. it hit me and I mm -hmm. cried like a baby in the coffee shop. And there's a very deep spiritual implication with that. For those of us that are believers, we, we all have that divine spark. We just lose mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. connection to it sometime through experiences, through our own choices, and both, and and lose sight of who we really are. And so that's why that stuck. And that's why I was so bent on that being the title before I got my publisher, Carrie Overburner. Mm -hmm. I told him I'm not changing the title, no matter what you say, <laughs> because it's tattooed on my arm. Wow. That's <laughs> so, good. Yeah, yeah, I love the analogy. And you're right. We do carry the light of God on the inside of us. But because of certain things that happen to us, especially in our childhood, that light, I don't think it goes away, but I think it gets covered up Yeah, and we can't see it. So I'm not going to have you go into great detail about what happened to you. Uh, right. I'm definitely going to encourage people to get your book because I, I really loved it. And it was very hard for me to put it down. 
but if you could just share briefly, because what I really want to do and I want to spend most of our time on is unpacking it and going into the healing journey. But yeah. you can just share whatever you feel comfortable sharing, Travis, and, and what happened in your childhood. Well, my mom um, married my biological father, and he ended up being very physically and emotionally abusive. Uh, he was an alcoholic. Um, she was very young when she had me, and um, they split up several times and I've learned through the years mm -hmm. um, but when I was five years old um, they had split up she had already um, started dating another man but he would show up and you know my mom was in a great amazing person I've lost her now but mm -hmm. so I never would throw her into the bus she was doing the best she could yeah. but he would come back over and basically force his way in and and then I would hear yelling and screaming well as time happened he ended up in my bedroom at least on three occasions and um, sexually abused me. And I pretended I didn't hear it. I pretended I didn't know. I put it away and didn't say anything to mom because I felt like it was my job as her son to take care of her, even at five. Right. And so, But then she finally got out of that situation. And at six, I was on the first date. Um, she had with a man who became my father, and I was blessed to have him for 41 years until he passed away in 2010, mm -hmm. and he was the greatest man I've ever met, mm -hmm. and uh, the first man I knew how to trust as a six-year-old, mm -hmm. um, but as as luck or whatever you want to call it would have it, we they married. It was a great life. We were poor. I was always so worried about what he would think about me, and in the neighborhood we lived in, in a little town called Marshall, Texas. Um, I ended up getting groomed by a gentleman um, and that began a process of three years of sexual abuse on and off. And the core decision and the reason that just happened and then I buried it like so many of us do is because happening two times, I reckoned that it must be my fault. Yeah. Um, if I tell mom and dad, dad will leave us Mm -hmm. And he has blessed our life and he makes mom happy. Mm -hmm. um, and then sitting on my bicycle out in the street at seven years old, I remember thinking, why is this happening to me? And, and like all of us, we're, we're God wired to seek balance in chaos. Yeah. But sometimes we tell bad stories to bring that balance. And I remember sitting there questioning, why is this happening? Why do I go to that man's house when he tell me to come over? Why, why don't I tell mom and dad? Mm -hmm. And the words came in my mind that I'm just a worthless person mm -hmm. and nobody loves me. And in my mind, it's like, okay, I don't have to fight anymore because there's the answer. Mm -hmm. And so I put it away and I put it away until I was a teenager. And, and then holding darkness like that, we're not wired for that. Right. So I just went through many years of different kinds of struggles because of that. Mm -hmm. um, and at the time, I thought, because I'm just a bad, worthless person. But right. it was because I was holding on to a bondage and a pain that we aren't created to hold on to by ourselves. Absolutely. Matter for man, woman, or what. Definitely. <clears throat> yeah. So the trauma gets you to believe these lies that you're worthless, yeah. that you deserve, that, that you maybe even caused it. And that prompts you to bury it even more. But like you alluded to, Travis, uh, a lot of people who have been sexually abused, both men and women, turn to drugs and alcohol. And that's the reason why I share these stories on Voices of Recovery, because this is about breaking free from a life controlling issue, which can be drug and alcohol abuse, but it can also be cutting and anxiety and fear and toxic relationships and all of that. But sometimes yeah. the root is that abuse and that trauma. And then you take your first drink, you smoke a little pot and you feel different, like, yeah. like that you feel numb to it and you feel good. Yeah. But you, you, you know, you feel better, but you're not better if that makes yeah. sense. Well, it's like putting a bandaid on a bleeding artery and, and what yeah. we do. And I mean, my whole practice is centered around what I call narrative integration um, okay. I know you read it in the book, the mm -hmm. phrase, words create worlds. Yes. And we create these worlds, but in, in trauma, whether it's sexual or not, what we do is, is we write these if-then statements. And, and we don't notice it because heavy, painful stuff and fear-based stuff goes down into our subconscious. But we, 
we create this if then statement of if I feel this way, then, and maybe it's a happen chance of trying a drug, or maybe it's mm -hmm. maybe it's getting obsessed too much with a job, or maybe it's anxiety. And, and all of a sudden it answered the question of how do I get out of this feeling or this thought cycle? Mm -hmm. And in the midst of that, I don't feel it. And so the brain's very economical in the way it works. It goes, okay, when you think about that again or feel that way again, there's the the push, go back to that drug, go back to that right. obsession, go right. back to that habit. Or when I was older, it, it was not the more destructive things, it was saving the world. Mm -hmm. As long as I was saving the world, I couldn't hear the monster in my head, but I became obsessed with it um, mm -hmm. at the expense of even time with my family and everything. As long as I was helping save the world, yeah. I didn't have to deal with the pain, but it doesn't go away, like you said, mm -hmm. it's still there. Absolutely. And when it comes back, it usually comes back heavier and worse um, yes. until, like I tell clients, all the lug nuts fall off and finally the wheels fall off. Mm. And we're forced to confront it in one way or another. Yes. Yes. I, I know what you say, what you're saying about the wheels coming off. And that's a good analogy for what you're talking yeah. about. Well, um, I recently interviewed a woman, her name is Kathy Studer, who actually pointed me in to your direction and she gave a startling statistic that one in six men boys are sexually abused by the time they're 18 yes i mean i that just that is shocking to me and yet you know i'm just thinking of okay pick any six men i know facebook friends or family or whatever and one of those likely has been sexually abused and that's yes. why i'm so grateful that you're telling your story and this story is uh, not only for people who have been abused, but it's also for loved ones and family members, because even though I am a coach and I help people in recovery, your book highlighted why people self-sabotage, why people kind of self-destruct because of the trauma that happened to them and they think they deserve it. And so if things are going well in their lives, that feels uncomfortable. So, you know, I got to do something to kind of I, that's not your probably your conscious thought process, but subconsciously it's like I've got a I got to throw a rock in the pond because it's just too calm. Yeah, Let's talk a little bit about that and just your thoughts on that idea of self sabotaging when things are going well because I'm just picturing people in my mind now that, that applies to and it's just very eye opening. Yeah, well, and it, and it applies to any trauma and mm -hmm. and the big thing now the reason. This is my passion for the rest of the days the good Lord gives me because yeah. that 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 idea that words create worlds, a lot of the trauma I work with with clients is not just the classic trauma, sexually abused or abandoned. It's it's trauma is more about the story we tell ourselves in the midst of the experience. Okay. You know, so I wasn't in bondage for 40 years to the sexual abuse because it ended. I was in bondage to the story I wrote and the beliefs that oh. came. Mm. And while in the midst of trauma, and, and I worked with one woman who was in trauma for 25 years, and we found the root of it. And the root of it was one night when her dad came home from work and told her she was getting fat. And at the moment, the story she wrote was, you're right, Poppy, I'm fat and worthless. And then she wow. began writing that story and, and wrote it for 25 years. But in the middle of trauma, when, when I said a while ago, we, we seek balance in chaos. The thing is, and the way our brain works, when we when we plant those beliefs and they become limiting beliefs, they really they tweak our identity to where we truly believe we're worthless and unlovable. Even from what I call the smile forward, we may be trying to live life beautifully, and mm -hmm. and nobody in my friend circles knew that I was struggling or right. knew that I had anxiety. But then what happens? Because in our subconscious, kind of like a a system of a laptop. We don't see the inner workings of the laptop. We see the outer right. and the inner workings of a person's mind that has gone through trauma and they've left it unresolved. Mm -hmm. All of a sudden, bringing balance out of chaos, we wake up at different times, maybe every few weeks, maybe every few months, and we almost have to bring chaos out of balance mm. because the fear and shame tells us you don't deserve this. The wheels are fixing to fall off. And if they are, why don't you be in control of the wheels falling off? Yes. And that may sound crazy to someone that hasn't experienced trauma. Mm -hmm. But when things go too good, that hacked identity, that internal narrative says, you don't deserve this. My monster would tell me, 
you know they're all going to figure out you're worthless and unlovable. Mm -hmm. So why don't you exit? Why don't you run? Why don't you throw a wrench in the gears? And many times I did that. Yes. That words create worlds. That was a powerful thing that you repeated throughout the book, Travis. And you realize that if the word words created a negative world, the words could also create a different narrative, right? And That's really key. it's replacing the lies that you believe with the truth of what God is saying about you, how God created you to be, your right. identity in God's sight. So talk a little bit about that, creating those positive words. Well, it's it's all about, and I know you just read the book, but it's all about that first step is, is discovery or awakening. We have to wake ourselves up to this narrative. Good narratives are easy to reach because they're right in the, the shallows of the unconscious. If I ask a client, tell me a favorite childhood Christmas memory, they can dip into the subconscious and it's easy to bring up. Mm -hmm. But those painful things that we buried and that a lot of culture teaches us, that's in the past. Let it go. Don't worry about that anymore. Keep moving on. Right. You don't realize it's it's a set of instructions in our subconscious that rise up when they want to. Mm -hmm. So we have to go through this process of awakening to that narrative, seeing the power of how it's connected to our current life. Mm -hmm. So we begin to see, oh, that's why I have so much anxiety or that's why I struggle in my relationships. So we make sense of it and we reach this moment <clears throat> where we go, my belief system's hacked and I'm believing all these lies and I have to flip that. And there's a period I take clients through that I went through myself years ago of realizing if I was so powerful to tell myself a story, to put myself in this deep of a bondage, all I need to do is flip the switch shine light into the darkness, truth into the lies. <clears throat> and it's a little more complicated than that. But what I'm sure. doing is I'm taking back my belief system yeah. to yeah. what it really was from the beginning, the way God created me. And then yeah. slowly unpacking that I'm not worthless. Some days I may feel worthless, but I'm not worthless. Some days I may struggle with the worthlessness of my experiences. Mm -hmm. If I bring them into the present and realize they only have the power now that the words I believe give them. And so yeah. if I tell a different story over that experience mm. and I begin to take the power back and use it for good. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I tell people, if you live near a farm, you can either look out in the field and see a lot of cow patties. <laughs> I think <laughs> I don't know what those are. Yeah. Or a little bit different perspective. We can see a lot of fertilizer to grow a really good garden. Mm. And that's what we have to do with our thoughts, with our words. We've made them for bad because of this belief, because of this trauma. Um, but it's 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 a power that we just flip it and use it for the opposite way. Absolutely. And with God, we can really do that. You, yeah. you wrote the book in three <clears throat> sections, and part one was is called Redeeming Your Past. And yes. uh, I, I love the idea of something being redeemed, something being restored. And this is what God is really good at. And no matter how messy your situation is, no matter what happened to you, I know that God can redeem your story. He redeemed yours, Travis. He redeemed mine and countless others who have been on Voices of Recovery. But one of the things that you talked about was getting to that point of acceptance. And again, I don't want to generalize, but I think, as we said at the beginning of the show, men tend to bury things more so than women. Women are more expressive of their feelings and willing to talk about it, whereas men don't want to say, I'm scared, or yeah. I'm hurting, or I need help. Those are not words that are easily spoken out of uh, right. a man's mouth. And, and I'm not trying to be, you know, like I said, generalizing, but it's, it's true. But I'm going to read a little excerpt out of your book because I thought this was so good. You met somebody who had had a very similar experience to yours. He had endured abuse, gone through addictions and, and hurt people. And you asked him, what was the key for him to, to find freedom? And this, yeah. is, uh, this is what he said. What made the difference the last time, the time that it all fell into place? He, that was your question. He responded, yeah. I accepted the truth of my story. 
I had been sexually abused. I allowed myself to stay in secret bondage for too long. I made some very poor choices that brought much pain to me as well as others that I held dear. It broke me. My reality brought brokenness and ultimately that brought freedom. This is you writing. I did not like how closely his story mirrored mine, but his truth was my truth. Before mm -hmm. I left my friend, I too embraced acceptance. I allowed brokenness to overtake me. I trusted this was a step of courage and strength rather than weakness, as I had believed my whole life. And he was right. It made all the difference in the world. It awakened me to my reality. Acceptance helped me to stop dwelling on the past. It gave me the courage to embrace the present, to embrace the starting point of my journey to freedom. And acceptance wasn't saying, well, this happened. And so this is my lot in life. And it's, I'm just going to stay in this miserable place. Like you said, it was the catalyst of freedom. So if you could talk a little bit about that, because I think it's so incredibly powerful. Right. It's, um, well, when you hear your own words read back to you, it's, it's a little emotional and I didn't Aww. expect that Aww. because it's so powerful. Yeah. Um, acceptance is key and acceptance is why so many of us, no matter what bondage we've had in the past, we repeat that bondage over and over and mm -hmm. we get lost in cycles. And I, and I tell clients all the time, every great journey has to have a good beginning. Every, everyone that runs a race, the winner of the race is usually the one that had the best start. Mm -hmm. And acceptance yeah. is the place where we get to, not that we stay, it, it blip on the map. And the reason we fear it is because culture teaches us that, well, you're gonna just reach a point where you say, well, this is as good as it gets. Right. I grew up or I'm going to stay poor. I grew up in bondage to anxiety and fear. I'm going to stay anxious and afraid. But acceptance says this, and, and this is the analogy I, I put in the book, I'm pretty sure, of reaching a point where we realize, look, God created all of us and he gave us this toolbox and it's full of really amazing tools. And, and they give us the ability to reach those intrinsic things like joy, peace, and love. And when you've gone through trauma, we detach our belief system from that to make sense of the trauma we're going through. Mm -hmm. And so we have to reach a point in life. And I do it in the office here with clients all the time where we say, look, we have to kick open your life's toolbox and we're going to look at it. And like I did in the moment I did this, we're going to see it's got a broke hammer or use roll of duct tape. <laughs> there are all the shiny, beautiful tools. Yes. Well, the the trauma the the choices other people made that affected us the choices we made and how to deal with that or not deal with it mm -hmm. made us disconnect from all the tools but they're not gone but we have to reach that point we have to understand and this is so key and sometimes so hard it was a 30-year battle for me mm -hmm. so I, I understand when my clients may take several visits to get to the point where they don't fear brokenness mm -hmm. Because our own beliefs about ourselves created the brokenness, not the experience. Mm. Well, that, that's key. The experience is bad. Those right. of us who have been sexual abused, that's bad. It mm -hmm. does break our spirit. But the brokenness we carry after it stops happening is yeah. our responsibility. And if we gave it the power, it should give us the strength to face it and have the courage to go. Brokenness is the thing where I hit reboot. Mm. And I tell people, brokenness stirs vulnerability. It makes us face who we really are and where we really are in that moment, moment in our life. And vulnerability is a superpower. Mm -hmm. Unlike what culture teaches us, that it's a weakness. Right. I tell clients, vulnerability is only a weakness on the battlefield and on the, in the sports arena. In life, it's a superpower to embrace who we really are, mm -hmm. to be authentic and real and say, this is where I am. This is where my story and experience has gotten me. Now I can take it all and wallow in it and stay lost for life. Or I can say there are tools in every bit of this, because like that same guy told me that that quote I shared, he said, you or no other human being can live a story that's not redeemable. You just have to be willing to want it. Wow. With God, they really are re all redeemable. And God is redeeming your story by using you now to help others. You had an encounter with this man who yeah. had a similar story and he spoke words of life over you that kind of unlocked something in you, which began your journey to freedom. And now I love how you're doing that for other people. 
through giving your testimony, through writing your book, through the coaching that you're doing. And that is just really what Voices of Recovery is all about, how God redeems our story. And there's no one, absolutely no one beyond his reach. Right. Amen. Yeah. Well, one of the things that you wrote about a lot, Travis, is this, uh, the monster, the inner monster, this inner yeah. voice of shame and fear and condemnation. And, you know, if, if something would happen, you know, I don't know, you didn't get picked for the sports team or whatever, here comes the voice saying, you know, you're worthless, you know, that you can't play badminton on the team. You know what I mean? Just whatever. I'm just yeah. using that as an example. So talk a little bit about that inner monster. And then I thought it was really interesting when you figured out who that was. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I believe, and you know, I'm not a psychologist, but I've done a lot of postgraduate work mm -hmm. brain and on trauma. And, and I think that was all by God's design. It was kind of me finding my own journey out of things. And now I use all those tools, but um some people call it the monster, the inner demon, the mm -hmm. voice that won't leave me alone, the hamster on the wheel yep. for clients with anxiety. That's a real mm -hmm. common. What it is, it's it's almost like our mind's effort to comfortably package something that's very uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. uh, not really a scapegoat, but it's like we, we're, by nature, we're, we're self-preserving. So we don't want to reach that point of brokenness it's hard to reach that point of brokenness. So we create this thing, this monster, the demons, mm -hmm. we put it on the fault of what we experienced. And then we, it's almost like we put ourselves in bondage to that. It, it's, it's like we build our own prison cell. And I talked about that in the book right. and, um, and we don't like it and we don't like what it says, but if we struggle with fear and shame, which most people that experience trauma, especially sexual trauma, deal with deep levels of fear and shame, mm -hmm. at least one of them, if not both. To me, they're very close cousins. Mm -hmm. And when the mind tries to make sense of a pain that it can't understand, that it can't explain, because you know our mind likes to close tabs like on a computer. Well, right. trauma leaves all these tabs open and they don't make mm -hmm. sense. So yeah. when they don't make sense and the pain threshold gets too high, the voice switches from us and our own efforts to, well, now it's just the monster. Mm -hmm. You know, when something goes good, or when I talked about the job promotion or the the, the highest paying job I ever had yeah. in the 90s, and it feels good, but mm -hmm. good feelings I don't deserve because I'm worthless and unlovable. So wow. the two economies don't mesh. Mm -hmm. So all of a sudden, that broken, hacked identity down in my subconscious says, yeah. well, you know, they're going to figure you out. Right. They're going to realize you're worthless and unlovable. Mm. And it's almost like that becomes a comfort. And that sounds ludicrous when I say it. Yeah. And it sounds yeah. ludicrous for those blessed to have not experienced trauma in their life. Mm -hmm. But it becomes a comfort. It becomes, oh, yeah, you're right. I don't have to try as hard. Mm -hmm. I don't have to keep going. I don't have to fight the pain. Mm -hmm. I don't have to push against the fear. Yeah. I can just go back into the prison cell, mm -hmm. decorate it, make it look nice, hang the big screen TV. Mm -hmm. And this is where I belong. You know, I mentioned the barbed wire blanket in the book. It's like we're cold. We reach for the blanket, but it's laden with barbed wire and it causes pain. But it's the only one we have. Mm -hmm. And we think it's the only one we deserve. Yeah. And so the monster wins. But the rest of the story is the monster wins only until we figure out who he is mm -hmm. and where he gets his power. Right. And that's what you talked about in the book where I figured out the voice sounds so familiar. Mm -hmm. And then, when, then there was that moment where I went, this is me. Mm. I'm the monster. Wow. Not in the sense that I'm a bad person. Mm -hmm. I created the monster, the, 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 the persona of the scapegoat of my fear and shame, mm -hmm. the keeper of my trauma. And man, yeah. when we realize that and we reach that point of acceptance, like, okay, I'm broken, but I'm tired of being broken. Yes. I'm not going to stay here very long. That's that jumping off point Absolutely. to begin the, the quest for freedom and then moving into healing. That's so good, Travis. And you know, like I said, this is helpful not only for people who have endured abuse and trauma, but for those who love them. Because, 
you you see your loved one doing great and and you got the job and and you got your kids back and and you know life is good and then boom it just blows up and yeah we get frustrated with the person, but we don't understand. Like you said, even when you voice the words, it, it doesn't even make sense to say it, but that's what's going on on the inside. And it just, like I said, things really clicked for me reading your book and, and you kind of allow us to get into your mind and what you're thinking about and what's going on. And if you don't tell your family members, they have no idea what's going on. So they're probably just mad at you. Like, why did you quit your job? And why did you do this? And why did you do that? They don't understand yeah. the root. They see the, they see the outward fruit. They don't understand the root of the abuse and what you endured. And so they just don't get it. And right. you probably don't want to tell them because you're not ready. Yeah. You have to try they to won't them. allow you to. Yeah. Right. right. And, and the more we avoid and do that, the more what I call surface struggles come about, more anxiety, mm -hmm. maybe more problems in the relationship. And then we either avoid or deal with those, but it's it's like having a garden full of weeds and using a lawnmower to get rid of the weeds. <laughs> They're going to come right back real quick. Right. And the work that I finally did in my own life and that I do with clients now is I say, look, it's not comfortable digging down deep, but there's a root to this. Right. The brain in all of us works the same way. There's a behavior, whether it's a good one or a bad one, and every behavior is rooted in a thought wrapped up in feelings and emotions, that's consciousness. And for all of us, that thought is rooted in, in the subconscious experience and memory. Mm. So for those of us with trauma, that experience and that memory burst those thoughts. And until we face them, they birth the behaviors and it doesn't make sense to us. Mm -hmm. We've got this whole hacked system. It's like a virus in a computer. Right. Why does it not do what I'm telling it to do? Mm -hmm. And shame won't let us explain it to our loved ones for a long time. And that's not an excuse. Mm -hmm. Just like it's not an excuse to say, well, I quit my job because I was sexually abused or I struggled with pornography because I was exposed to pornography at seven. Yeah. But it's reasons. It begins to help us understand that experience, thought, behavior, pattern. Mm -hmm. And we have to understand it to unwire it. Right. And, and build back what God gave us from the beginning. Yes. And I know, like I said earlier, a lot of people kind of have that don't go there. I'm not going to go there. I want to try to forget about it, numb it, ignore it. But numbing it and ignoring it doesn't make it go away. Right. And you have somebody who can kind of guide you through the process. It's like if you're going into brand new territory, you need a guide with you who knows the territory. Right? right. He knows the pitfalls. He knows the places to avoid the places that you need to go. And so that's what you really provide for people. But you're also pointing them to God, because I believe that it's really God who can get those deep roots out because he sees them and he knows exactly what they are. He knows how they got there. Right. So speaking of that, um, you have a moment in the book where you kind of have it out with God and, you know, um, I'm not a religious person. I, I love Jesus and I'm a Christian, but I, I, I don't deal well with religion or religious people, right. you know, and it's like, oh, clutching our pearls, you cussed out God, you know, he can handle it. All right. But right. we have these moments where, you know, we, we do, we're, look, God knows our, how we're feeling anyway. You know, right. he sees it. We're not going to be able to pretend with him. So sometimes just getting it out and having it out with him is healthy. Okay. So talk a little bit about that, if you would, please. And uh, just kind of share that experience because let's face it, a lot of people who have been abused or traumatized in these ways um, want nothing to do with God because, you know, it's like, right. oh, God, if, if you're real and you allow that, I want nothing to do with you. Yeah. And that's, that's so unfortunate. But if you would talk a little bit about that. Yeah. Well, so many people I meet don't want to have anything to do with God. And, and most of the time I find it's not because they want to blame God for their abuse. Now, sometimes that may be true, but most of the time it's because of the religious establishment leading them to believe I can't go to God with this unless I'm nice and pretty and cleaned up and perfect and, <laughs> and don't have all these struggles and emotions and doubt and yeah. anger. And, you know, I tell people, and like you said, it, in, in Hebrews 4, it says we're naked and exposed before God. Yes. He knows anyway. Mm -hmm. And 
if if we need to yell, cuss, scream, put our fear and anger out there, who are we going to do it with but God? And, and I tell people all the time, you can do it here with me, but, but especially when I know they're believers, do it with God. And I said, I sat on a boulder on the side of a mountain in Tennessee, and I had it out with him. I call it my Psalms 22 moment, because that's where David said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Yeah. And, and I speak pretty colorful sometimes because I'm Irish and Scottish. And I said, if David's language was in today's language, it would kind of be, God, what in the F is going on with my life? Mm -hmm. And I had that moment. Mm -hmm. And it brought me to the place, the most pivotal moment in my healing, wow. just like my most pivotal moment in my abuse that set me on the course. This pivotal moment set me on the course to healing. Because I was yelling out to God and screaming through the trees and scaring all the animals away. <laughs> I just yell basically at God and myself at the same time. And, and, and I'll say it this way instead of the way I said it. But I said, what are you so effing afraid of? Mm. And so every client I see now on the first or second visit gets asked the question, what do you fear most in life? Mm -hmm. because what I've learned is that becomes the impetus or the vehicle for us to dig into the subconsciousness and bring up the trauma narrative. Mm -hmm. And sometimes people aren't ready to answer it. And I tell people, you know what? I don't know is an answer temporarily. So if you don't know, I don't know. Well, yeah, yeah. it. Me, I guess I was primed and ready because I just began to weep uncontrollably. Mm -hmm. And even though I had known this in my psyche for years, I'd never fully spoken it, especially as an identity, not a feeling. I had I had struggled with feeling worthless. But in that moment, the answer to that question was simply, I'm afraid that the whole world knows I am worthless and unlovable. And we don't like to feel that pain. But you know what? There's pain of losing our leg in an accident, and there's the pain of rehab and that kind of pain is the rehabilitative pain it's not a destructive pain it's a constructive pain mm -hmm. we have to get to the place to to embrace that because see we're already embracing pain we're enduring pain all the time because we're in struggle we're in the middle of bondage and it comes up and it goes away it comes up and goes away yeah. so that moment is a reckoning mm. to where i've identified the root my fear, my shame, my pain is because I really believe I'm worthless and unlovable. Yes. And there's power in that. Great Absolutely. power. Yes. And really, Travis, you know, as you're saying that, I see that in those moments, you're carrying around that five-year-old Travis who's afraid, who's wounded, who really can't process what happened to him, but, uh, you know, by his own father and all of that. And, and people really get stuck. Yeah. But when you voice it, even if you're, you're saying that to God, you know, and you're having it out with him, he usually comes in with that still small voice and says, you are not worthless to me. And I love you so much. When we can give voice to the root, God can pull it out and replace it with the root of his love and acceptance. Right. That's right. so good. Well, I, I want to mention, and I know we're, we're getting short on time and I just have so many things I want to talk to you about, but you talk about that pain is your friend in your book. And I've, right. I've actually done a teaching on the gift of pain. So I really liked that part of the book because people do everything they can to avoid physical and emotional pain through a variety of things, substances, right. and not people, um, activities. Talk about how pain is your friend. Well, and I, I, I'll try to do it briefly, but I start out with a physical analogy, and especially this is true in Western culture. If, if we have a painful knee and it hurts and it constantly hurts and every day I wake up, it hurts. The typical response is I'm going to go to the doctor, give me a pill. No, wait, don't give me a pill. Give me a shot. I want the pain gone yesterday. Right. Well, you may have something going. No, I'm just tired of hurting. Yeah. And we do that emotionally. So this is where we get escapism, which escapism is... The bad addictions and the good addictions, you know, obsessed with work and lost in a hobby and leaving relationships behind. But we avoid the pain at all costs. But like in the knee analogy, the brain is taking care of us and it's sending a signal and giving us pain. 
not causing us pain. It's giving us pain. Mm -hmm. So instead of getting the shot that just masks the pain and we have to go get another one, we go to the doctor because the doctor knows the language of the pain. Mm. He said, well, let's look into it. Let's test it a little bit. Your body was trying to tell you you have a torn meniscus and it was only going to get worse. Yeah. So we, we fix it. The pain was our ally, our friend, mm -hmm. because it told us if you don't take care of this, it's going to get worse. Right. Now, then we still have a pain to endure because if we get that knee fixed, we go to rehab. Yeah. But now we've taken over control of the destructive pain mm -hmm. and turned it into constructive. And it's the same in us. We don't want to deal with the pain. But emotional pain is telling us, even though we want to forget the past, that there's open tabs in our subconscious. Mm -hmm. We need to close those tabs. We can only do it by finding res resolution and closure. I tell people we learn something from it and we're able to let it go. Forgetting it, you don't let it go. You just throw it in the closet, you know, mm -hmm. pretending it didn't happen, moving on with life, running away from it. It doesn't go away. And the pain comes back when it wants to. And when you acknowledge pain as an ally, you instantly begin to take control of that pain. And now you use it as a tool instead of a, debilitation, a debilitating experience. That's good. So pain is a tool in your toolbox because Absolutely. it lets you know it's a warning. Hey, yes. you need to deal with this. And so instead of numbing it, right, dressing it and connecting with God or a coach or somebody so that you can heal what's causing the pain. And when you heal what's causing the pain, it goes away, right? Yeah. The knees, yeah. the knees, the knees healed. I don't have pain anymore. That right. trauma is healed. I don't have pain anymore. That is right. so good. That's so good. Well, again, there's so many things that we could talk about and I'm only at part one <laughs> about redeeming Ooh. your story, but yeah. I want to take a little bit of time and just give you the opportunity. First of all, is there anything else that you would like to share? I'll give you the floor. Is there anything else that you have for our audience today? Well, th that you've read the book, you know how special this is to me. But when I get an audience, uh, I want to share my core life mantra with them. Mm -hmm. And at first they may go, I don't get that, but I want them to take it, chew on it, dance with it, sit with it. But it's simply this. You carry all the light you will ever need to eliminate all the darkness you will ever face. Yes. There is no trauma, no sexual abuse, no relationship that fell apart that is more powerful than your potential to be who you are fully meant to be. It's just learning that I've moved the plug into a different outlet because of that experience. And I kept it in there long enough that it took over my belief system. Mm -hmm. I just have to get the help from God, a coach, a counselor, somebody to help me recognize it and see it. Somebody that's outside the story that can ask better questions. I'm a professional. I went and got help. It, we all need it so that we can plug back in so that we can do a reboot so that we can pay attention to those emotional and mental check-ins and lights and find the courage with help to say, look, those things are my ally. Mm -hmm. Fear is a construct. I created it. So I don't have to fear fear. Mm -hmm. Shame is a result of my hacked belief system. Mm -hmm. Pain is a warning light. That's telling me something needs to be addressed before it gets worse. Mm. so we carry all the light we'll ever need we just sometimes need help reconnecting to it that's so good i love that okay and then final final thought here i would like for you to take a moment and speak to men yeah. i'm really hoping and praying that this message goes out far and wide to men who have endured yeah. trauma and i'm asking for the audience to help share this out because yeah. I bet there are people that you know who experienced trauma and abuse and you have no idea and yeah. this message could help them. But if you could speak specifically to the men who have endured this, I would really appreciate it. Yeah. Well, I'll start with one of the lines I put in the book and, and tell the men that may hear this, look, I'm not perfect. I'm a flawed human like we all are. I'm not God's gift to man, but I did grow up a country boy. You know, I can skin a buck and run a trot line. I can take care of my family. Mm -hmm. I was an athlete and a jock. I'm a military veteran. I've been a tough guy, both on the bad side, fighting when I was young, and on the good side, standing up for right. I'm a man. 
And I believed for a long time that vulnerability was a weakness. Get up, dust yourself off, keep going. Real men don't cry. That's BS. That's the cleanest way I can say it. It's BS. Vulnerability is a superpower. If you're sitting there and you're a soldier, when you're on the battlefield and the enemy's facing you, vulnerability is a weakness. If you're a professional athlete, vulnerability is a weakness. In life, in your marriage, in your struggles, vulnerability is the superpower that reaches you to the point to be courageous enough to say something in me, in me is broken and I need to face it. And I, I, I implore you to face it. I've lived on both sides of the fence. Do I wish I'd have reached it sooner? Sure. But I didn't waste those years. God's now redeeming them and yeah. using them ad infinitum. He's going to yeah. use the years I have left to redeem the 40 years I was in bondage. Mm. You know, So I have all the joy in the world, but I don't want it to take the other people, the other men, 20, 30, 40 years. And, and you can turn your life around in a matter of weeks and months. Amen. Realize being vulnerable with your story is a superpower. So good, Travis. Well, the book is We Are All Fireflies, Finding Your Light in the Darkness. Travis is a life coach, author, integrator, helping people turn limiting beliefs into limitless potential. So if you're a private person and you just want to get the book and quietly read it, you can go through it. And he gives so many great nuggets of truth. And he's that person that's already walked through that wilderness and he can help you get to the other side more quickly. And if you want extra help, you know, I will give Travis's information. You can reach out to him. And this is what he does. He helps people walk into that beautiful light. Well, Travis, I so appreciate you because it took courage not only to tell your story, but to put it in a book. And I'm just so glad you did because I know that you're helping so many people and it's such a much needed message in our world today. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you for being our guest. And thank you to our audience for watching this episode of Voices of Recovery. We're creating a safe place where people can go on their journey with God. If you're new, please give us a like or follow. And again, please, please share this message out because there are people you know who need to hear what Travis had to say today. So God bless you, Travis. Thank you so much. And thank you to our audience. And we'll see you next time on Voices of Recovery. Bye-bye.